In the previous video, we used the lax milgram theorem to prove the well-posedness of a partial differential equation that was in dimension one. So we really want to go to higher dimension just to show that it also works for PDE, which is the topic of this class. So what we want to do is to, to do this uh, higher dimension. And uh, what it would mean is to have distributions in higher dimension. So in the previous chapter, we, we, we explained how to do distributions in dimension one. We did not get into the details on how to extend this to higher dimensions, even though we gave references to on how to do it. Um, it also requires defining sub of spaces in higher dimensions. Basically, the definition is the same. H1 is a set of all functions that will be in L2 of omega, such that the derivative would be in L2. Uh, and so so on and so forth. Now, there are a few um, things we need to be careful about. For instance, the Willish theorem is not exactly the same in higher dimensions because the dimension of the space uh, you know, plays a role here. So uh, we need to be careful, but uh, basically what we're saying is that what we did extends to higher dimensions. And what we will do in this video is consider d equal to and pretty much do what we did uh, in the previous video, but in the setting of dimension two. In other words, uh, we will consider the, uh, this equation, f is in L2, we consider Laplace operator uh, minus Laplace operator applied to u equals f in a domain omega, which is smooth enough, c1, we won't, won't be uh, having problems with, with, with our domain, uh, we'll have enough problems as it is, so um, we just consider a domain which is regular enough, and u will be uh, equal to zero on the, on the boundary, okay? So we prescribe that u is equal to zero on the boundary. Now, contrary to what we did in the previous video, what I would like to say is that usually this problem cannot be solved explicitly. So it's actually interesting to, well, first of all, prove existence uniqueness and well, poseness in general of that, of, that, of, that, of that problem. And then in the next chapter, chapter five, we will see a method called the finite element method that will allow us to approximate the solution U as close as we want, uh, provided, of course, we have enough uh, computing resources uh, at our disposal. Let me state the theorem that will be the counterpart to the theorem we just stated in the previous video in dimension one, that is uh, this, uh, the, the, the counterpart in dimension two. So uh, well, basically I mentioned D with D equal two is, is what we're gonna do in this, in this video. Okay, so omega will be an open bound set, set, including RD that will be smooth, smooth enough. F is in L2. And then what I'm saying is that there will be a unique solution U in H10 to the versional formulation associated to the Dirichlet problem. Uh, on top of this, we'll have U that will satisfy minus Laplace operator applied to U equals F almost everywhere in omega and U in H10. On top of this, we'll have the, uh, the, the, the smooth dependence with respect to the data that is that there exists a constant, a positive constant C omega, independent of F, of course, it's a constant, such that the norm of U in H1 will be bounded by this constant times the norm of F in L2. And finally, if omega is regular bounded open set in, in C1, which again, we'll just consider this, then U is a solution to the Dirichlet problem, uh, minus Laplace U equals F almost everywhere in omega and U equals zero almost everywhere on the boundary. To prove this theorem, we're gonna apply exactly what we did in dimension one with the seven steps. So let's start with step one. We will um, assume that U is in C2 uh, and C2 of the, 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 all the way to the boundary, so the, actually the closure of, of, of omega. Uh, and that u uh, on the boundary is equal to zero is a solution. So, so we assume this, again, that's not part of the proof, it's just what will allow me to write the versional formulation and then start from there in step two. All right, so I multiply my, my, my equation by phi on both sides, I integrate over omega, and here's what I get. I get minus integral over omega of Laplace u times phi equals the integral of f phi over omega. Then I use the Green's formula. 
When I do the Green's formula, what happens is that my Laplace operator turns into a, a del on the other side. So I got del u del uh, phi, so, so the, 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 the scalar product, the scalar product of Rd, uh, R2 in this case, um, minus uh, what, what it really is the normal derivative of that uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the boundary equals the integral over omega of f of f phi. And I will use again the fact that phi is with compact support to remove that uh, integral and the, the, normal, the, the normal derivative here, obviously because phi vanishes on the, on, the, on the boundary, then all I get is the integral of omega of del u del phi equals the integral of f phi. All right, now that I have this, uh, I write this on my piece of paper and I'm gonna start the, I'm gonna start the proof using this formulation. And again, that first step is not part of the proof for a very simple reason is that I cannot assume u is in C2. Uh, because, I mean, if I already know that u is in C2, uh, well, then I don't have anything to prove, right? So, so obviously that's not part of the proof. I would like to stress this. I'm just going to use this to actually start the proof now. So the proof starts now. Um, let us consider uh, this uh, equality. And based on this equality, as we did in the previous video, we will discuss, we'll actually define a um, bilinear form A, which is the integral of del u del v, del, 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 del v, which corresponds to del u del phi, right? I mean, so, so basically what we have is a u phi. Um, so I define a, so it's, it, it works this way. And L is going to be such that on the right-hand side of L of uh, phi. So it's going to be the integral of f v over omega. U vanishes in the boundary, so we're going to choose this h. Uh, we saw it was uh, a pretty good choice in the previous videos, and we're going to do it again. Uh, and A and L are going to be defined on H, no problem, you can just verify we don't have any definition problem when we are working in H. Okay, now step two is almost complete. All we need to, to, to remark is that uh, the, 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 the equation which is all the way above here can simply be written as for all the in H, a u v is equal to L v. So, of course, our intent at this point is to use the lax midram theorem. So, let's check that A and L are continuous. Well, guess what? Uh, A is continuous for the very same reasons as we had in dimension 1 in the previous video, and so is L. So, we use Cauchy-Schwarz for A, Poincaré for, for, for L, and guess what? A and L are continuous on H10. And again, I would like to stress that the choice of H10 is not a chance. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, we, we, we basically uh, chose H10 for that reason. Coercivity of A works again the same way. Uh, when I do the AUU, that's going to be the norm of U H10 squared. And of course, that will give me coercivity of uh, my function A. And again, I'm going to stress what I already said, which is that the norm was the, 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 the norm we chose on H10, basically the space, the Hilbert space we chose, is uh, basically working because so, so we chose it so it works. Uh, you know, that's why we made this choice of Hilbert space. We could have chosen other Hilbert spaces, but this one is the one that makes it work. And again, that's often the tricky part is to find the right Hilbert space. All right, step four is completed. Step five, we apply lax minigram. We are in the context where we can. Uh, H is Hilbert space. A is a bilinear and continuous a bilinear form. L is a linear and continuous form. And of course, A is coercive. Therefore, lax minigram applies and tells me that there is only one, there is one U and only one U in H such that for all V in H, A U V is equal to L V. And I have that a u u is equal to l of u implies a, the norm of u in H10 is bounded by the norm of f in L2 multiplied by a constant, which means that the variational problem is well posed. Now, let's do step six, which is solving the PDE in D prime. Okay. 
So we have the uh, virtual form and we know that this uh, virtual form has a unique solution uh, in H10. Now we, we know that uh, that is true for all V in, in, in H10, so it must be true for a subset of H10 and that must be, that, that, that can be for instance D. Uh, so for all test functions phi, I can write this, which means that I can derive that the gradient of U uh, del U uh, del uh, phi is equal to F phi for all phi. Here is an expression and then what I can do is I can rotate my, 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 turn, my turn my del operator into um, a divergence and divergence of del U is going to be minus Laplace operator uh, uh, applied to U. Uh, and then that's minus F phi since I'm, I move my, my, my right hand side to the left. So what I end up with is minus Laplace U minus F phi equals zero for all phi. Now again, what I have on the left of the bracket here, minus Laplace U minus F is a distribution. Since that is true for all phi, uh, that means that minus Laplace U minus F is equal to zero. In other words, minus Laplace U equals F in D prime. And of course, U is equal to zero on the binary. Now, everything worked pretty much the same until now. Now, we're going to have a little problem in step seven. Uh, we have U in H1. In, in the previous video, we, we had U second equal, I mean, equals, equals F or minus F. So that was in L2, right? But here what I have is uh, minus Laplace U equals F and F is in L2. So, so what I can say is minus Laplace U uh, equals, is in L2. But the, the Laplace operator is just the sum of the second derivatives. It doesn't mean that each derivative Second, that each second derivative is actually is actually is actually in in, in L two. What about the 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 cross derivative? I mean, we, we we just cannot guarantee at this point that U is in H two. So uh, that is a little bit of a problem. We can guarantee though that U is equal to zero on the boundary, but we cannot go back to U in L two. Now, there are cases where we can. Uh, we're not going to prove it, but I'm just going to state it. Um, so we cannot conclude that U is in H2, but if omega is a disk or a square, then we actually can say that U is in H2. Same if omega is a convex polygon, or if omega is the image of a convex polygon by a diffeomorphism. So, uh, if, if omega is not too crazy, then uh, we will be able to recover the fact that U is in H2 and therefore, uh, you know, basically say, okay, uh, this is what, what, what we had, uh, you know, like in dimension one, which is that we're going to have the, the solution to, to our problem. So this is what we have for this, uh, for this, for this chapter four. As you could see, what we did is really capitalize on what we did last week. Last week we did distributions, we did Sobolev spaces, and this week by doing the Lax-Milgram theorem, by actually stating this Lax-Milgram theorem, we are now able to prove well poseness for a for a class of elliptic partial differential equations that uh, we, we saw a few examples, and of course you can adapt these methods to this method to uh, different types of problems.